Forbidden topics, lesson that'll get you criticized, called out, or canceled. This is lesson number five in that series. The title of this lesson is The Sobering Truth About Alcohol. And it's part of a kind of a mini three-part series uh, entitled uh, Dealing with Addictions. So as I said in this uh, third session on the topic of addiction, I'd like to talk about the substance that has addicted more people throughout history than any drug or pill, and that would be alcohol. We've talked about all kinds of drugs, but alcohol is the king, if you wish, of addictive substances. Despite all the interest and the increased use of marijuana, alcohol in its various forms is still the addictive substance most widely used all over the world and most often abused. Part of the reason for this is that it is uh, legally obtainable and cleverly marketed as a positive lifestyle product. Commercials and ads for beer or other alcoholic products, uh, for example, have a certain message or a certain view about the people who drink beer and not the beer itself, you know, not the alcohol itself. The commercial is always about the people, not, 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 you know, not the alcohol. They, uh, they rarely ever say, drink our beer or our beer is on sale. I've never seen a, commer a commercial for beer and, they, and, the, and the, uh, you know, the promotion is, our beer is cheaper to buy, you know, or we're having a sale, 15 cans for the price of 12 cans. <laughs> I've never seen a, a commercial like that. No, major marketing efforts promote ideas or images that imply or demonstrate that beautiful, sharp, hip people drink beer or wine or hard liquor or whatever, but the people in the ads are having fun. They're intelligent. Uh, they're good looking. They're smart. Uh, the marketers want to get the idea across that drinking is fun or it's uh, what to do when you're having fun or you want to have fun. That's why there are funny commercials about beer. I remember the ones about the frogs, you know, uh, Super Bowl commercial with the frogs. Nothing to do with frogs, but it was funny. It made you laugh no matter what. Even if you're a non-drinker, you laughed anyways at the commercial. And that's the point. I remember when I was using drugs, I wouldn't go out to a party or a club or a concert without drugs because I thought it wouldn't be any fun if I didn't get high. Is anybody bringing any stuff? No? Well, yeah, I'm not interested. But we're all going over to so-and-so's house and we're all going to go there and going to watch the game. Anybody bringing any booze? No? Oh, well, you guys go ahead and have fun, you know, without me. The drugs made everything better, or so you think or thought. Another subtle message is that Drinking doesn't make you drunk. It's strange, but lots of beer commercials show people doing things that require a clear mind. Driving, skydiving, water skiing, you know, they're all, they're all in action things, you know, things that require you know, quick reflexes and that you're paying attention. They never show a guy in his lazy boy with an empty six pack dozing off during the Super Bowl. They never show that picture of that guy. One effective uh, message is that you are desirable to women, well for men, you are desirable to women uh, with a drink in your hand or brandy or tequila or something. What makes you mature, sexy, worldly, is that uh, you consume alcohol and you do it without apology and you do it without any negative effects because you look healthy, you look strong and handsome and 
fresh. And then there's the, uh, the recruitment type ad that sells the idea that everybody drinks. What's the matter with you? Everybody drinks. Men drink, women drink, older men drink, younger women, they all drink. The point here is that you're on the outside if you don't drink. Of course, with the rise of alcohol addiction and death due to alcohol abuse, the marketing of alcohol changed to incorporate an additional message built around the theme of responsibility. These are the ones that really, <laughs> really get me. So uh, we were and continue to be hit with these new, more caring ads for alcohol, which pushed the following themes. Drinking is okay, so long as you do it moderately. One of my favorites, know why you drink. <laughs> know why you drink. Don't just drink, know why you drink. And usually a very nice, soft focused ad featuring a young person, maybe with their dad, having a conversation. And the idea is the dad is teaching them, here's, here's, what, here's the story about alcohol. I'm going to teach you how to be mature and so on and so forth. Or drinking is for the mature. Drinking alcohol is a mature thing meant for mature people. In other words, the ads went from drinking is for beautiful, sharp, dynamic people to drinking is for smart, mature, successful people. And then my personal favorite for the height of hypocrisy is the soft cell type ads, the ones that promote the idea that the manufacturers of alcoholic products actually care about people. They actually care about the environment. They actually care about society. This last message is the most cynical and dishonest of all because alcohol has been an addictive curse on mankind going as far back as Noah, 4,000 years before Christ. So these deceptive messages are necessary to convince and encourage people to buy and to use a product whose major active ingredient is the addictive substance of alcohol. Let's look at the statistics, shall we? The less flashy and alluring images about alcohol are found in the cold hard statistics that reveal a much less shiny picture of the real life effects on the people who use this substance in various forms. Now there's all kinds of brands and drinks and mixtures, but they all have a common denominator. They all, all of them include the addictive substance of alcohol as their basic ingredient. So you can have all kinds of hard liquor, soft liquor, you can have, you know, even now seltzer. Remember, you used to drink seltzer. It was used to, you used to mix seltzer and put it into something, you know, with alcohol. Now they have seltzer that has alcohol in it. It's the newest, uh, it's the newest thing. So the manufacturers of alcohol just are always looking for ways to keep up and to market their, uh, market their product. So here are some of the latest statistics related to the use of alcohol and some of the negative outcomes. Alcohol is an addiction substance. It works like other substances to addict and kill those who use it. 28% of highway deaths are already are, uh, linked to, to alcohol, drunk drivers. 40% of all violent crime committed by those under the influence of alcohol. This is not my opinion. This is not the preacher. This is just cold, hard facts. You know, dig them up, go online, you know, find the facts about alcohol. 40, imagine 40% 40 of all violent crime committed by those under the influence of alcohol. 
a person normally, you know, nice person, so they get some liquor into them and their character changes. You ever hear the expression, a mean drunk? You, know, you have happy drunks, when they get drunk, they get all happy and sloppy and you know, I love you, bro. You know, they get, they, they're like that and they fall asleep. And then you get mean drunks. When they get drunk, they take offense at any little thing and there's a fight that takes place. 40%, all violent crime, all violent crime. I mean, it's just mind boggling. 12% of teenagers are alcoholics. 30% of all suicides committed while under the influence of alcohol. Because when things are going bad in your life, but you're sober and you begin thinking of maybe taking your own life, you know, your, your mind, your conscience, everything you know answers back to you, not a good idea. But if you've been drinking all night and your inhibitions have been lowered, your conscience has been silenced by alcohol, maybe pulling the trigger is a pretty quick way out of your problems. Why not, you say? Alcohol consumption has been directly linked to cancer. Mouth cancer, liver cancer, we know that, but throat and lung cancer. 50% of domestic violence, child abuse and drowning involve alcohol abuse. In other words, 50% of people who drown were drunk when they drowned. Alcoholism costs $175 billion a year to the government to treat and to deal with the effects on families and individuals. $175 billion. The, the al alcohol manufacturers are not paying for that. It's not their 175 billion bucks that are treatment centers and you know, taking care of the mess. Yeah, that, that's taxes that are paying for that. One third of all prison inmates were drunk prior to or during the crimes they committed. And like other addictive substances, alcohol is legal and is heavily promoted. Imagine a substance that causes so much social damage <laughs> is heavily promoted. And so what people say about alcohol is very different from the reality of what actually happens in our society because of alcohol. The facts are not the same as the commercials. Well, I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist so that's all the numbers I'm going to give you. I'm a preacher. I'm going, to, I'm going to deal with the number one question that all preachers have to deal with as far as alcohol is concerned. Is drinking alcohol a sin? Is drinking alcohol a sin? Of course, the question that is debated among Christians is, as I say, is alcohol a sin? This is not a question asked by non-Christians. I've never heard a non-Christian say, is, you know, is drinking alcohol a sin? They don't care. <laughs> a non-Christian is only interested in, you know, is it legal? Where can I buy some? You know, uh, what's the, how much alcohol can I take and drive and, and you know, be legal? That's what they're interested in. They're not interested is if, it's in, if it's safe or not. Since alcohol is addictive, uh, we have to practice moderation and teach our young people to use alcohol responsibly. That's about, that's about the uh, sanest thing that non-believers say about alcohol. It's more complicated for Christians because we're called upon to remain sober-minded and not jeopardize our spiritual alertness not jeopardize our clarity of mind and self-control with any substance or pattern of thinking, false ideas or teachings. For example, in 1 Peter uh, 1.13, Peter says, therefore prepare your minds for action. What, what actions he talking about? He's talking about life. 
Every day, the stuff that happens to you and to me, every day, that's the, that's the action. There may be a day or two that goes by when it's just a regular day. You, you get up, you go to work, you come home, you go to bed, you get up. And, the, and then on the, on the third day, something happens where you have to make a decision about something that's critical. That's why Peter says, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is, a, this is a dark and sinful world that we live in. And you know what? Even as much as, as, as in the church, we try to encourage each other to do well and to, you know, to, to act like a Christian, there's still sinful activity that happens among ourselves that split us apart, that starts arguments, that cause shame. So imagine out in the world, you know, where they're not even trying. First Peter five, verse eight, Peter says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He doesn't usually devour somebody who's sober. Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. There are also scriptures that repeatedly warn believers about the dangerous and the dangers inherent rather in the use of alcohol. Uh, Solomon said, wine is a mocker. Who is wine mocking? Who is mocking you? You're the one being mocked, being laughed at strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise, is a fool. And then in Proverbs 23, he talks about someone who drinks, their life is, you know, revolves around alcohol. He says, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your mind will utter perverse things. And you will be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea or like one who lies down on the top of a mast. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. Does not talk about the person who is continually involved with alcohol. It's contentious. You're always in arguments. There's always problems. You see things. You see your mind sees things. You misunderstand. You argue. You beat yourself up. And after all the trouble that alcohol brings into your life, uh, it, says it, it says, when shall I awake? Awake from what? From my drunken stupor. What will happen? He says, I will seek another drink. And we say, oh, surely he's exaggerating. Surely, you know, hyperbole, it's hyperbole. Well, let me tell you about a man that I know. This is a part of a family picture. There's more people in this picture, but I asked uh, Hal to kind of you know, blow it up a little bit and put a, a square around that man. That's uh, Paul, his name is Paul, Paul Veilleux. And Paul Veilleux was a, a very talented, uh, you know, window dresser uh, for many years ago, worked for a large department stores, 
doing those things. He was very artistic. He was my uncle. And he was married to that lady, you know, that lady down there, that was my aunt Madeline. And then you recognize right in front of him, that was my dad, there's Tony. And there's my mom below Tony, you know, he's got his hands on her shoulder. Anyways, there's Tony and mom's a family pit. And there's uncle Paul, he was my favorite uncle because he was such a nice guy. He was such a nice guy. You know, but he was a mean drunk. You know, I said a happy drunk. He was a, he was a mean drunk. And uh, many, many years later, he was probably in his 60s, and I had grown up as a young man, and I had heard he was in the hospital, and he had bone cancer from his lifelong alcohol addiction. And he began drinking, he told me once, when he was 15 years old, at a wedding. Someone said, eh, have, a, have, some wine, have a glass of wine, you know. Well, what, what will my dad say? Ah, it's Christmas, come on, you know, it's the wedding, you know, enjoy yourself. Just a little wine, can't hurt. And he himself told me, he says, I took that glass of wine and that was it. <laughs> I found the love of my life when I took that glass of wine. And I never stopped drinking from that moment on. And I said to him, uh, and I was a new Christian, not very long in, in the faith. I, I, I tried to share the gospel with him and I said, Uncle Paul, I said, uh, if God you know, forgave you for all the bad things that have happened in your life and, and, and he made you well, like you, you regained your health over again, you know, immediately, like, like he, held, he, he uh, healed lepers, you know, what if he healed your bone cancer and you were well? What would you do? He says, wow. He says, well, I'd get dressed and I would leave this hospital and I would go to the first liquor store that I found and I would buy a bottle of gin and I would start drinking. And he told me, do you know why? And I said, why? Because I love it more than my life. Yeah, that's what alcohol did to him. See, he was pretty good looking there because he was still young then. He was a drunk in those days, but you know, a functioning alcohol. But he died a sad death. So back to our original question, is drinking alcohol a sin? Well, there are only two possible answers, right? Yes or no. And I'd like to examine the reasoning behind each of these. So let's start with yes. Is drinking a sin? Yes. Any consumption of alcohol in any of its forms is sinful for several reasons. Well, number one, the Bible warns of the negative consequences of its repeated use, which we ignore in doing so. When we ignore what the Bible warns us again, that's called against, that's called rebellion. That's what that is. It says, don't do that. Stay away from that. And what do you do? You go ahead and do that. Yeah, that's called rebellion. Another reason, having one drink may not be sinful by itself, but every addiction always begins with a first ingestion of the addictive substance whether it be alcohol, cocaine, heroin, whatever. It always starts with one. And not to recognize this is foolish. Alcohol, using any amount of alcohol begins to diminish our spiritual awareness and our mental clarity. It dilutes the effectiveness of our sobriety, which we are told to guard. I've read you several passages where uh, 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 Peter is saying, you know, uh, guard your sobriety, remain sober for the purpose of uh, prayer. And so disobeying that, you know, discarding that uh, exhortation is called disobedience. Using alcohol dilutes our Christian witness. 
Using alcohol diminishes the effectiveness of our Christian witness as uh, sincere, even zealous believers. You know, people see Christians who drink, they see them as lukewarm or worldly minded or soft. It's like, if you're not a Christian and you know a couple of Christian people, you know, you're just around them and among them, one of them drinks. And uh, you know, a bad thing happens in your life, you need some advice, you, know, you need to talk to somebody that you can trust. Usually the one who drinks is not the guy you're going to talk to or not the girl you're going to talk to because you see them as being soft in their faith. You, you want to talk to the Christian who's you know, convinced, who obeys his own, you know, the teaching of his own religion. This is called hypocrisy. We say we're one thing, but we purposefully do what contradicts what we, what we say and what we claim to be. The use of alcohol contributes absolutely nothing to our faith, nor does it glorify God in any way. There isn't any way that we glorify God when we use alcohol. This is called worldliness. So there's a couple of reasons. You know, we said, is, a, is a drinking a, a sinful, a sin? And if you say yes, well, there's, there's a whole bunch of biblical reasons why. But just to be fair, Let's take a look at the no side of this issue. Now, Christians rarely say that drinking is not a sin, period. They don't say that. They say things like, well, the Bible says drunkenness is the sin, not just having a drink. That's usually the number one you know, argument. And that's a little bit like saying, lusting in your heart isn't a sin, it's when you have sex with that person that it becomes a sin. See what I'm saying? There's a line, there's a trajectory here. We know what Jesus said about that. The first step on the road to sin is sin, just like the last step is sin. The most common defense of this practice, again, among Christians, is that drinking in moderation is not sinful because there's no drunkenness. But this is how many believers participate in social drinking at parties and clubs. I'm drinking responsibly. I'm being, you know, drinking moderately, so it's okay. In other words, they're using the argument that non-believers use in their use of alcohol. So here are a couple of responses to this type of thinking and attitude towards alcohol use. First of all, social drinking is the consumption of alcohol simply for pleasure's sake. You know, would you buy a bottle of liquid that costs $40 if it had no alcohol in it, it just tasted like pineapple juice. Yeah, no. Now, the reason you pay $40 for a bottle of, I don't know, whatever it is, gin or rum or whiskey or brandy or, uh, is because there's alcohol in it. You know, I had a debate with a young guy once about marijuana and uh, his argument was, oh, all the good effects of marijuana is good for you here and there. And, you know, it calms your, your, your spirit and uh, you know, it's pure and it's from the ground. And I said, yeah, but I said, but if you, if, you, if you didn't get off on it, would you grow it? Would you, would you smoke it? Would you smoke it? Would you roll yourself a joint and smoke it if you didn't get off? If there was no chance, there was zero chance that you got off, that you got a buzz, you got a high, and I remember he, he thought about him and he said, yeah, no, no. And it's like smoking oregano, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, would you do that? Would you take some basil and some oregano and put it in a paper and roll it and smoke it? Well, no. Well, it's the same thing. Would you pay for a bottle of, 
you know, liquid mixed fruit juices, would you pay 40 bucks for that? With no guarantee of any effect on you? Well, no, come on. Then there's the use of alcohol for what the substance does. It lowers inhibition, it relaxes the senses, it, it affects the motor skills, things that diminish the spirit and stimulate the flesh. That's what alcohol does. And you can put up all the arguments you want, that's why people drink it. Social drinking undermines our Christian witness. Using any type of highly addictive substance for recreation's sake to fit in, to downplay our purity and godliness diminishes the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Non-Christians uh, that you drink with may be relieved to know that you're not some kind of religious zealot and you won't go out and you know, have, who won't go out and have a drink with you, but they're not impressed with your faith or attracted to your Lord by your attitude. You know why? Because in the end, you're one of them. You're comfortable in the world, doing the things of the world. Well, I want to hang around with you. Social drinking puts one at risk for addiction. As Marty says, duh. If you drink socially, you drink privately. And the regular ingestion of the poisonous and addictive substance of alcohol continually heightens your risk of addiction. All alcoholics begin as social drinkers. That's a hundred percent. Why would a Christian knowingly do such a thing? Why would you do that? Social drinking makes you less useful to God. This one here speaks to those Christians who really want to please God, but for whatever reason, they use alcohol too. Well, social drinking makes you less useful to him. God does not call those addicted or fighting addiction or too immature to realize the danger of addiction into serious ministry service. He might let you do some small things, but he won't let you do any big things. Why? He doesn't recruit the weak willed. He doesn't recruit the worldly, the spiritually compromised to do the heavy lifting in the church. And then of course, what did Jesus do? Many justify their consumption of alcohol based on the fact that Jesus drank wine and even transformed water into wine. In John chapter two, verses one to 11, we're familiar with that, we're not going to read it. The wedding at Cana. What we have to understand about that episode is as a Jew living at the time and place he did, it is safe to say that Jesus drank wine and even produced wine miraculously at the wedding at Cana. However, research about the customs of those times reveals the following. And again, this is unbiased research. It's what did they do in those days? Well, here's a little bit of information. Jesus used wine as food. He was not a social drinker. Using strong drink for recreational purposes in public houses and feasts. He wasn't like that. Did he associate with sinners? Absolutely he associated with them to bring them the gospel, but he didn't associate with them in, 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 so that he could share in their vices. He knew drinkers and adulterers and gamblers and cheaters and you know, you name it. But that doesn't mean that he himself was participating in their sins. 
The wine that Jesus used in the first century was low in alcohol content, perhaps, you know, 2% alcohol maybe. As opposed to today, beer has 6%, wine 13%, liquor 50 to 60% alcohol. It's all manipulated today, unlike at that time. In addition to this, the Jews would mix their wine with water, thus further diluting the alcohol content. Those who drank fully fermented wine without diluting first with water were considered barbarians. They were, as they called them, wine bibbers and drunkards. Matthew 24, verse 49, that's what they accused Jesus of. He's a wine bibber, you know, meaning he didn't dilute his wine, he didn't remove the alcohol effectiveness of his, of his uh, wine. There's no reason to think that the wine that Jesus miraculously produced was any different. It may have had you know, one or two percent alcohol content since the quality of the wine was based on the type of grapes that was used to produce the wine, not the percentage of alcohol. The wine didn't taste any better if it had a 9% alcohol you know, percentage or a 15%, it didn't affect the taste of it. That, that's all dependent on the grapes and the way you make it. You know, the comment that the steward made, remember he said, you know, the, you, you, you gave them, uh, you know, your better wine at the beginning and then at the end uh, when people have drinking, they drank and they've eaten, you know, uh, most people give the cheap wine at the end to save money. Because why? Well, after you've eaten a full meal, and you've drank, you know, your taste buds are not exactly uh, ready for uh, fine dining. What did Jesus do? He produced wine that would be from the best of grapes. The taste, you know, you could tell from the taste. Some people, you know, they say he, <laughs> <laughs> he produced like, you know, wine that had 13, 14% alcohol content, you know, which made it good wine, no. So if, if, if Jesus is your model for drinking, well then good for you. Then you're drinking wine, 2% alcohol wine, and you're diluting that with water and you drink only the fruit of the vine, no beer, no liquor, no consumption of alcohol for recreational purposes or in bars or clubs. No, 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 you don't do that. So you want to be like Jesus? You want to use wine as food? Well then, yeah. You do it exactly like he did, then that'd be fine. Another question that comes up, well, what about Paul's instruction to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23? He says, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So note that Timothy only drank water at a time when water, especially in cities with public supply was contaminated. The only alcoholic drink that can help stomach issues is red wine. That's true even today. Uh, research uh, has found that red wine contains polyphenols, which increases the good bacteria in the stomach, uh, which in turn helps with digestion. Note that the instruction is, he says, a little bit of wine with water, you know, the mixture as a medicinal treatment. He didn't give him a green light for social drinking at various you know, kinds of alcoholic drinks and you know, uh, parties and nightclubs and stuff like that, public houses. We see the medicinal use of alcohol for those near death or extreme sorrow in the Old Testament. Yes, give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to him whose life is bitter. But alcohol used in primitive medicine 
However, today we have effective medication to treat digestive issues and chronic pain, as well as emotional issues like depression. We don't need to use alcohol as a medicine anymore. So let me summarize. How do we decide? Well, part of maturing in Christ is the ability to make concrete decisions that reflect both the teaching and the spirit of God's word. I know that even in my own life, my understanding and teaching and practice concerning the subject of alcohol has evolved over the years and is now represented in this particular lesson on alcohol and what is commonly referred to as you know, moderate social drinking. And so good decisions about the way you use alcohol by Christians, as well as good decisions about any number of topics that involve what is right or wrong for believers need to be based on facts and the teaching of God's word. Not feelings or commercials or what's popular or what others choose or encourage us to do. In this spirit, therefore, I give you five reasons, four or five reasons against the consumption of alcohol in any amount. Very quickly. Five best reasons to drink. Well, it makes you feel good. Uh, isn't that the truth? It makes you feel good for, for a time. Against, alcohol is the number one drug problem in the world. On the yes side, alcoholic uh, drinks taste good. They taste good and we can mix them all kinds of ways and they're enjoyable to drink. Well, that's true. Also, alcohol is one of the major causes of illness, accidents, death, crime, and family destruction. Three, most people can drink without getting drunk or addicted. That's true. Alcohol contributes nothing to a person's well being, whether that is physical, emotional, social, or spiritual, in any way. In any way. Number four, alcohol is inexpensive and easily available. Very true. Number four, on the no side, the Bible warns against the dangers of alcohol and repeatedly uh, condemns its abuse in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor drunkards will inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians. Uh, nine and 10. And one more on the yes side, everybody drinks at work, business, family occasions, friends encourage us to drink. I often see other Christians drink, so why shouldn't I? And then on the no side, Christians who drink alcohol weaken their spiritual lives and undermine their influence for Christ with the unsaved. No one actually admires a Christian who permits himself the use of alcohol. No one will ever compliment you for that. My only regret as far as this topic is concerned is that I was late in coming to these conclusions, especially as someone who abused drugs for many years and was rescued from that destructive life by the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel of forgiveness. I should have known better might have helped other people. In any event, you have the facts before you and I ask you to decide. If you drink casually, moderately, once in a while, every weekend or every day, reconsider your decision based on the Bible and the facts and stop. It's the right and biblical thing to do as a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you don't drink, then decide now, ahead of time, that you'll never start. Prepare your answer for those who insist that you join them in a drink. Don't be ashamed to say that you don't drink because you're a Christian. Be ready for the blowback, the disappointment, the laughter, the, uh, the ache of hurt at the, at the quiet rejection that'll follow uh, when you tell them that. But just remember, just remember that there is some, sometimes there's a price to pay as a disciple 
but realize that there's also a reward for doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. And I pray that God will bless you and that you'll remember to stay sober for the purpose of prayer. All right, that's the lesson for tonight. Next week, another happy-go-lucky topic, pro-life or pro-death. And I guess maybe after this lesson tonight, we, we know a little more why it's called, classes that'll get you criticized called doubt or canceled. Thank you.